Hi, this is Jane Slavin, and you're listening to the Sirens of Audio. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the podcast devoted to all things Doctor Who and the Doctor Who universe in the audio medium. My name is Dwayne and joining me is... It's Philip. Hey Dwayne. Hey, how's things going with you? Yeah, things are great. Staying busy, lots of things happening all the time, so lots of good things to listen to. It's been great. The man with six kids, there's things going on all the time, really? Yeah, just one or two things now and then. (laughs) Uh, very good, very good. Hey, listen, I have been listening to so much audio lately that yesterday I got sick of it and I picked up a book. It's a book that I've been wanting to read for a long time. It does relate to audio, so I'm going to tell you a bit about it. I wanted to, I picked up, um, I can't remember where, it's been sitting around on my shelf to read for probably 12 months and I brought it along with me on the on the trip that I'm on, hadn't hadn't even touched it. But it is Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. I'd never read the book. Uh, I'd seen a few different versions of the movie. And I found the book an absolutely riveting read. Have you read it, Philip? I have read it. It's an amazing book. And thinking it was written in one night is astounding. Wasn't it a short story and then expanded on? Yeah, I think, I believe so. But yeah, she most wrote a lot of it. She fleshed it out, yeah. In one night, yes. Yeah, pretty amazing stuff. It's um, really interesting because we've been talking lately about Big Finish authors and we've been pretty excited about the, the number of female authors seeming to increase. And I, I'm thinking about it, I think this is strange to be talking about. Why has there always not been that level of equality? Well, I can't even believe I'm saying the word equality because I'm not usually that political. But I've noticed that, yeah, the number of female authors has gone up considerably. And yet here, I've, I've been reading over the last day, just finished it tonight, a book that is considered the first science fiction novel of all time written by a woman. So, so women, women had it first. And what, what I did notice from the book is the ambiguity around the monster um, because there's, there's been different versions of the movie um of the story well there's been different versions of the story on film and i think the one that came closest to me that i have actually seen would probably be the the kenneth branner one with robert de niro um the 1930s one with boris karloff doesn't even come close um so it's virtually a different story if you ask me but this book was a fascinating read and I'd love to actually hear it performed by someone as an audio book at some stage when I've got the time to do it it's uh it's totally different do you, how long has it been since you've read it do you remember I read it in year 11 so it was a very long time ago that I read it though okay, it, so uh, just, I just listened to the big finish production last year with Arthur Darvel yes um playing Frankenstein but yeah it's been a long time since I've read the book now and one thing I mustn't have heard, I mustn't have listened all the way through to the Big Finish one because, as I was reading the book, there was a section in there where Frankenstein heads to Scotland and Ireland via London, and I said, "I've never seen that in any of the movies that that uh, that he goes to that part of the world." But apparently, in the Big Finish version, they include that section in it. So, although they do put some characters in there that aren't in the book. Uh, I noticed from the cast list. So it's making me want to go back and listen to it again to see how close they got to it and see... I'm, I'm really interested in Nick Briggs' portrayal as the creature, actually. So uh, I'm going to go back and listen to that again. Very, very interested in that. But I just thought it was interesting that we've got that first science fiction novel written by a woman. So considering the, the amount that we've been talking about female authors in Big Finish and science fiction in general... I and think also that's, discussing uh, two 
we were also discussing how women tend to be very macabre and bloodthirsty and just put it all out there. Once again, the, the whole story does that too in terms of, you know, there's nothing genteel and sensitive about the story. It's very emotionally draining and taxing as well and quite, you know, bloodthirsty. Yeah, but when, when you think about the movies, uh, because interestingly, the book has no mention whatsoever of how he made uh, the creature, uh, and it has absolutely nothing to do with electricity, which all the movies seem to want to do. They want to get this electricity involved. In fact, the book alludes to the fact that he's more a chemist than anything else. So he's dealing with chemistry to get the to get the creature created, but it never goes into it never goes into full depth about the description of the creature. Never goes into a full explanation of what he did to create the creature. And it leaves it open to lots of different interpretations. So now I understand why I've seen different movies with different interpretations of how the creature was created. But these movies that are probably adapted by men, there's a big focus on the creation of the creature, whereas the book is much more focused on the human story, the internal turmoil of both Victor Frankenstein and the, in, the inner turmoil of the creature. And that's what had me going. Uh, more than anything else, the the turmoil. It, it's an absolutely tragic, but beautiful story. Funny calling yeah. it a horror and science fiction, but it is a beautiful story. Yeah, and then right, it's a tragedy too. Mind you, you uh, it's, it's been redone and rethought through so many ways. Last time, I was in London three years ago. I went and saw the Mel Brooks musical Young Frankenstein, but that's just a farce. <laughs> tap dancing, <laughs> tap dancing Frankenstein monster. It's amusing. But it's funny what they do in terms of uh, what Mel Brooks does to the whole thing. Yeah, absolutely. All right, that's what I've been doing over the last day, uh, listening to a lot less audio and reading more. But I did listen to an audio yesterday. I, I tell a lie. I didn't listen to any audio today because I was reading, finishing the book. But the audio I listened to actually features our guest tonight. Uh, because I wanted to listen to something, but I listened to something I hadn't heard before because I, I hadn't caught up on this one, and it's the Lost Story Nightmare Country that was released last year, uh, a Fifth Doctor, Turlow and Tegan story, written by Stephen Gallagher, who also wrote Warriors Gate and Terminus. Have you had a chance to hear that one, Philip? I have, and actually, it's interesting, because he wrote the story for the 21st season, and I think a one-sentence line which was just, we can't make these sort of blockbuster films go away with the script. Um, yeah. Because it's just too big. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a shame, really, because they probably, if they were going to try and tackle something like Frontios, they probably could have done something like Nightmare Country as well, because Frontios was pretty uh, challenging uh, to realise on the screen, even though it was a fantastic idea. But I I really enjoyed this story. It was It was... Really interesting, delving into aspects of quantum reality, quantum physics. Um, Janet and the Doctor both have du uh, dual roles to play in it. So, especially Janet has a has a good role to play, and I absolutely love the way the story ends. Do you remember how the story ends? No, I must confess, I only listened to it once. How's it? Well, it must be. It must. What? Well, I don't know if I can spoil oh, it's spo it. But spoilers. It, it it would spoil it, and I'd like to encourage anyone to have a listen to it. It's got a great, great ending. But a lot of these four part stories, you know, how we've been talking about them potentially dragging. You yourself have not been a fan of four parters for a while, but this one had me riveted the whole way through. I didn't stop. I didn't stop for a break. So. Uh, I can highly recommend Nightmare Country and uh, be curious to see if Janet recalls anything about it um, when we talk to her shortly. Uh, probably a good opportunity too to, to have a look since we're recording. This is going to go out a bit later, but we're recording on the first day of November in 2020. Um, and a, a shout out to our friends in the UK too. Really sorry to hear about the 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 hassles that you're having there with your with your second wave and your lockdown it's it's pretty upsetting a part of our country went through that a few months back and it was it's been upsetting for everyone but to to have the the whole country there under lockdown it's um it's pretty tough so our thoughts go to you but if you're a big finnish fan you've got lots to look forward to in the month of november um anything in particular that you're looking forward to philip 
Well, I love River Song and the Tenth Doctor River Song series coming out. They're going to be pretty good, I think. So that's probably the the highlight. But but there's actually lots of great stuff coming out. So yeah, what are you looking forward to, Dwayne? There is. I'm I'm actually looking forward to um, the next Time Lord Victoria story because I loved Brian the Ood. I mean, it sounds silly to say it out loud. Um, but it, it came across really well in the audio. I don't know if you've had a chance to have a listen to that one yet. No, I love Brian the Ood. Yeah. The psychopathic, the psychopathic Ood. He's played so differently and so well. Oh, and actually, that re- that reminds me, I, I liked it so much, I put up a little review on our website. So if you go to signsofaudio.com, we've got a review section where we put some little written reviews of things that we've listened to. There's not too many up there at the moment, but do check it out. Uh, what else is out? Shadow of the Daleks the second instalment of The Fifth Doctor's monthly adventure. Uh, There was a series of four one-part adventures released in October. Part two is going to be released this month, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. I like the one-part stories. Yes, the one I'm looking forward to, because I really got to the end of those first four stories. I enjoyed them, but I've got no idea what's going on. Because you're being the same same cast going round and round. I'm very glad you you said that, because I was was struggling a bit myself. I was struggling a bit myself. So I'm looking forward to see how it all wraps up this month. Um, we've got Torchwood, Risa Nianto's excellent barbecue, which looks fantastic. The cover looks very funny. Um, interesting box set, a Fifth Doctor box. Boy, the Fifth Doctor's getting a lot of uh, treatment at the moment. Um, Wicked Sisters is coming out, which is a, a box set featuring the Fifth Doctor and Leela on a mission from the Time Lords to, uh, I think, is to destroy uh, Abby and Zara, who have had their own spin-off box set with Big Finish in Graceless. They were part of the Key to Time sequel, Key to Time, uh, from oh, many years ago now. Um, so that's coming out too. So if, you've, if you're fans of, of those two and the Graceless box sets, I'm sure keep an eye out for Big Finish's specials. They're putting out specials every week, and if this is being released, they might do a special on the Graceless box sets, unless they've done one recently that I don't know about, Philip. Um, there's a Blake 7 audio book coming out, uh, which looks interesting. And yeah, 10th Doctor, 10th Doctor and River Song looks, looks very cool. It'll be interesting to see those two together. Uh, the short trip as well is, uh, called Blue Boxes. So it's always worth having a subscription to the short trips. They'll drop into your account every month and they're always for a quick listen, about half an hour, 40 minutes, always guaranteed to give you a fantastic story and, um, because there's no, not even an audio budget for those, apart from a little bit of sound design, um, they can they can be quite quite different to your regular to your regular Doctor Who style story, even on audio. Uh, would you agree with that, Philip? Yeah, I would. I the favorite series I had for a long time was the Companion Chronicles, which usually only had one or two cast members in it, but it meant the the writers had to be super creative. And I think that the short trips have sort of taken on that mantle now. So often they're, they're very creative what they do. I think it was the um, Indie Fisher one recently was just superb. Because um, it was all told in first person as Charlie, which just made it more powerful and just a strong story. So, yeah, there's some great short trips there. There's a master one as well. And actually the other one, the Rufus Hound one, um, ah, where he's playing the meddling monk, is just brilliant and it's so funny. But so, yeah, great twist at the end. So there's some great ones out there worth getting into. There's, there's, uh, I, I like that one with Jeffrey Beavers as the master. I can't remember what it's called now. Um, you'd have I think to it's I Am it. the Master. I Am the Master? Yeah, that's right. Mm. There's he one... wrote that too, I think. Did he? Yeah, I'm sure I don't, that's I don't remember that. Mm. And uh, there, there was also one that really grabbed me uh, from a couple of years back, um, by Matthew Waterhouse. There's, a, there's an Adric story that was... Do you, do, you, do you know the one I'm talking about? It was very, very different. Uh, if I can find it during our interview, I might put it in the show notes. But, um, yeah, Matthew Waterhouse has done some some great stuff too. Um, not that I'm a fan of Dark Shadows as much, but I know he's done a lot of work with Dark Shadows. But I, I really enjoy his Doctor Who stuff, which has changed a lot since he first started. He, he, he sounded like he was struggling a bit to get the original Adric voice, but um, in the more recent audios, he's, he manages to to do that a lot 
easier, I've noticed. Yep, so there I you agree. go. Okay, so I might throw in a trailer for Doctor Who, The Lost Stories, Nightmare Country, and then we might come back with Janet Fielding. Sound okay? Sounds brilliant. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Lost Stories. A sacred blue box. Oh, that's the first. Nightmare Country. Doctor! Doctor! It's me, Tegan! Did she say Tegan? I don't know. Young woman, you've been misled. Those are the Vodiani. Step away before... <laughs> Yeah, I've got it. Does the Doctor know you're taking his TARDIS apart? Do you even know what you're doing? Can anyone hear me? Anyone? Yeah, don't start digging yet. It's a tomb. Nothing nice ever came out of a tomb. Don't you find that everything about this place is just a little bit off? We're on a graveyard planet where spaceships fall out of the sky like sparrows in a gas cloud. How normal is that? Wherever we've explored, it's been one big necropolis. There seem to be burial zones for different races and cultures. She thought there was no danger. And look at her. No breath, no heartbeat. You've killed her. Is there something wrong? I may not be able to remember how I came here, but I can be reasonably sure that if you're intending a successful launch, the last thing you need is a flammable rocket. Hey, no! What are you... Doctor, come back! I'll stay back! Or I'll snap her neck and end it here! Your time will come, each of you, to serve our needs until we, old Yanni, have secured our future! Give me your hand! He's got my hand! Your other hand! He's pulling me in! Hold on! Oh, my what do you think we're trying to do? No! Big Finish. We love stories. And what's the next surprise? So, Jenna, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to see you. How have you been? Yeah, well, like a lot of people, it's been a difficult time. I mean, it's been a lot harder for us here in Europe than it has in Australia, because you've got a better grip on the coronavirus than we did. Yeah, we've been very lucky. Well, yeah, but see, I think the thing is, London's one of the world's great crossroads, so that makes for a special problem. And also, um, our government didn't get a handle on test and trace, you know, and that makes a big difference. Um, that whole, they punted it out to Serco, and um, Serco, you know, yeek. Right. They just haven't done a good job. No. But you've managed to stay safe, though? Yeah, 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 yeah. So you're going to lockdown for a month again this Thursday. What's lockdown going to look like for you? Not that different. <laughs> <laughs> really, to be honest with you, not that different. And because um, I don't, what it'll mean is not going to cafes and restaurants locally, which I do try to do because, you know, they need all the support they can get. But I don't go to London at the moment. I don't. I go to Canterbury sometimes, which is nearby, um, but I don't often leave Ramsgate very much. What will lockdown look like? Are you allowed to go out for walks and things? Are you allowed to get takeaways yeah, still? Yeah, so I'm very lucky because I live right near the seafront. I'm right on the seafront and I can go for long walks along the cliffs and things, so that's lovely. And when you walk out, you know, you run into friends and, you know, so you can have a distance chat or whatever. So that, on that score, I'm really lucky. So are you, have you been able to do any work or recording? What have you been? Yeah, so what we've done is um, I've been uh, writing a book. Oh. Um, yeah. Uh, and then I've also been, so I'm now on third, fourth draft, fourth draft, and then the charity that I run, which is a youth charity, we've been doing projects with young people, but mostly online, and then some small workshops, socially distanced, face masks, all the COVID secure stuff. But it just means you can't have as many kids in the workshop as you normally would, you know, so. But like, for instance, they did, um, they did a project at the recent Ramsgate Festival of Sound. In fact, they did two projects. Three, I tell a lie, three. 
So, yeah. Now, the, the charity, uh, yeah. to just touch on those two things, so the charity you, you've been involved with is Project Motor House. Is yeah, that correct? that's right. Yeah. So you've been involved with that for a lot of years now. Um, yeah, just yeah, 10 years, yeah. 10 yeah. years, wow. And that's helping youth in the area. It's um, teaching them skills yeah. of business and trades, is that right? Well, actually, um, what we tend to do, we're really not, we've evolved, you know, as we've gone on because there was a building side to this, which was saving a building in Ramsgate, um, a derelict building, but the council, who were going to give it to me and do the frame. So ended up selling it because they were broke. And um, it sort of evolved into an arts heritage organization for young people. So we do a lot of art projects. Primarily we do photography. We do a lot of photography. Photography is really, working with SLR cameras is really for good for young people in all sorts of ways, you know, it, it helps build that confidence because they're technically challenging, but, you know, a bit of expert tuition and you can start to produce a good result. And it teaches you to look at the world more carefully and, and things like that. And then during lockdown, we produced, um, we got, we ran a small Instagram project, uh, a photo competition for, for local youths in the area under 18s. And we're going to be doing a series. So we're just making a series of films to run six um, comp small competitions based around a particular visual theme. So, you know, the first one will be light and shadow. And then right. you know, the others like portraiture and things like that. Right. Architecture. Lots, lots of young people involved in all these. Yeah, we had 145 entries for the, for the previous project. That's exciting. I think it was just under 300 kids in the last, our last financial year. Brilliant. Do, do many of the kids recognise you from Doctor Who days or not, not really? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I guess some of them do, but not... I mean, I think you'd have to be a fan of the old series. And you get, you get kids whose parents are movie and... But it, it's really funny. You don't think that people know who you are and then you find out that they do. Polite enough not to hassle you about it. Yeah, they are, you know, generally speaking. I mean, you know, we've also got uh, Brenda Blethen is a local resident and, and, and indeed one of our trustees. And I mean, one of the, the events we did with the kids was showing a load of their photographs at a, at a picnic, a socially distanced picnic and music uh, concert. And um, nobody hassled Brenda, you know, she was there, but, but people leave her alone, you know, so it's quite polite. That's great. Now you said you're working on a book. What's the book about? I'm not going to tell you yet. <laughs> Any clues at all? Um, well, you know, it'll be going out soon. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. I okay. will let you know. Looking forward to it. So, fourth draft. So, it must be getting close it's to being ready. It's non-fiction. Non-fiction. Brilliant. Yeah, but okay. it's not a biography, although my biography is in it. Okay. Oh, I. Okay. You've got me curious now. Okay. The biography of quite a few Doctor Who people is. Fantastic. Okay. This is going to be amazing. Good yeah. stuff. Now, we wanted to talk to you a bit about um, your audio work and big finish work in particular. Oh yeah. Um, so, but yeah, so where, where it goes. Now, Gary Russell, when he um, first started doing Big Finish Audios, he said there was three people he wanted to work with. Yeah. He wanted to work with Paul McCann, Tom Baker, and you. Right. So, okay. I, I don't know whether... Did he, say you know, that? he did say that. There, there were three people he was after, and you were one of them. I, I think maybe it was a bit of a challenge. Um, Actually, where he cornered me was at a fan convention in Sydney. I would have been there, actually. <laughs> yeah, in 2003. 2003. Right. And that's where I... Because I'd worked with Wendy Padbury just slightly on The Five Doctors, but that's where I kind of really got to know her and got friendly with her. Yes. That's and I had thing. never met... I don't think I'd ever met Katie at that point, and I met Katie at that as well. But Gary 
bless his furry little feet. He, um, <laughs> he talked me into doing a big finish and I said, right. And I thought I'd be really, really rubbish at them. So I didn't want to do them. Is that, and is then, that, is that why? Is that, was it that you were concerned about how you come across? Um, well, I thought it was a long time since I'd done any acting. And so I was a little bit hesitant about doing any, because you kind of, you know, you decide to move on with your life. But then he talked me into it and I found I enjoyed it. And it was really lovely because I used to see Peter anyway in, because uh, we're both members of a club in London called Soho House. And so I used to see Peter anyway. And then I sort of re got back, you know, you, you got to see, I got to see Sarah again and, you know, and, and Mark and Matthew and, you know, the old crew and, you you know, you've known each other 40 years. And, do you know what I mean? You're just really friendly. And, and um, so that's been really lovely. And then the big Finnish team are just lovely, you know, and... Uh, and I really enjoyed it. And Toby's lunches, you know, at the studio were just superb. How could everyone, you not? How everyone could you not? The lunches. Yeah. <laughs> how could you not be in love with Toby's lunches? You know, I mean, it's. I'm about to do some more in December. Lockdown. The lockdown. Versions. Okay. I mean, I've got. I'm set up. I can do a home set up, but my internet isn't as good as it should be that sort of thing, really. Can I just say that uh, we spoke to John Dorney a couple of weeks ago, and yeah. uh, he said that he got his first job with Big Finish by talking with Gary Russell at a Sydney convention. I reckon it was the same one. So it was a very oh, really? fruitful convention in uh, 2003. Lots of good yeah. things happened. Well, who knew? <laughs> who the hell knew? Isn't that amazing? People need to come That's... to Sydney. It's where things happen. <laughs> I know. I'd love to get back there. I really would love to get back there. I mean, last year, I went to Australia three times. I planned to go once because my youngest brother was turning 60. Your baby brother? My baby brother. And my baby brother had been so good with my parents. And I said, we should really all the siblings get together and celebrate or commiserate. And um, so I planned a holiday in August last year. And then my dad died in July and my mum died in November. So I ended up going three times. And, you know, it's just... I'd love to have gone this year again because, you know, I, I love seeing my brothers and friends in Australia, you know. So it's kind of, oh. And I love Sydney. I haven't been to Sydney for ages. Actually, 2013. Right, okay. And I hadn't been to Melbourne in 2013. I don't think I'd been to Melbourne since the 70s. Right, wow. And I like Melbourne because that's better shoe shopping. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's the, the unclean city at the moment, yes. The and I, I have very small feet. So in England, I tell you, this is the land of the Bigfoot. <laughs> it is really hard to get the right shoes if, you're, if you've got small feet. I have to go to France or Italy, which I can't go to at the moment. No, is, is there, are the borders open between the different countries? Um, they were. So friends of mine came back to Rome, from Rome recently, and they got back just before you had to go into quarantine. Right. Because, but Italy's infection rate was climbing, so. Yeah, it's been pretty tough. Yeah. Um, okay, so when you first came back to Big Finish, is it? Head back a little yeah. while. Um, yeah. so it was in 2006 you did your first audio and you actually played a con your contemporary age of 2006 rather yeah. than, was that, was that your, your choice in terms of, I'm going to come back, I'm going to do one for you. No, it wasn't no. your choice? Not at all. And he gave me a terminal disease for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> because I said I'd only do one. 
he gave me a terminal disease. And then when I complained, he said, you told me you were only going to do one. And it was his last show. But luckily in the TARDIS, that doesn't matter. No. Because you can go back in time or forward. So it was a positive ex- so we did that one audio, that was a positive experience. So that because there's another four years before we came back again. Um, was it? Yeah. Was it really? It was. 2006 you did your first one, and it was 2010 when you came back into the trilogy with Sarah Sutton and Mark and started doing they started doing three every year. So basically since yeah. then. Yeah. So it just took you a while to, to get into the swing of it? No, that's their ch- choice, I think. I, well, I think what happened was I kind of was sticking to my, my guns, but then about it being my last, you know, only doing the one. And then I think they kind of went, I kind of got talked into more because, like, it was fun. Yeah. That's what happened. Did you find did you find that you just fall back into Tegan though? I mean, she's a character you played for so many years. Yeah. Do you, just feel, do you just feel comfortable playing her? Yeah, I mean, I had certain. Um, it was really funny because <laughs> Peter, Peter and I started taking the piss up. I mean, the, am I allowed to say taking the piss? Yeah. Anyway, now. Peter and I do take the piss out of each other a lot. I mean, a lot. And. Um, David has said you have to watch out when they're being polite to each other because that's when it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so in, in, on that, I, I did change quite a few lines or I wanted to change quite a few lines. And the reason was, Joe, who, who don't get me wrong, I thought he'd done a good script, but he'd made Tegan a bit unkind. And while she was... She was cranky at times and quite assertive. She was never unkind. And there's a big difference between being assertive and being, you know, quite feisty and being cruel. And I thought he'd made her a bit cruel. So I can remember that I changed a number of lines and I said, no, 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 that's wrong. Tegan isn't like that. She doesn't. She isn't cruel. She's just cranky at times. Confident herself. And confident, yeah. She doesn't take any nonsense. So what was it like? I mean, the first group you did, you just worked with only Peter. And then you came back and you you were also working with Sarah and Mark. Had you done much? Had you been keeping in contact with Sarah and Mark much between times? I don't stay in contact with Mark much. But or, or Matthew, although I do email them from time to time, um, but I stay in semi-regular contact with Sarah. Yeah, fairly regular. And the same with Peter. Yeah, because we kind of, we were together for the longest, in, in, you know, and it just kind of works out that way. Yeah. I mean, stand by for the Blu-ray of, I think it's season 20. Because Sarah, Peter and I do a road trip to Germany, to Kassel in Germany. And I promise you, it is hilarious. <laughs> um, why did you go to Germany? Because there was a fan convention on. And what uh. happened was, Sarah, had, Sarah and her husband had bought a new car. And I said, well, let's take a week to go to Germany and see a bit of Germany on the way. Good idea, said Sarah. The next thing I know, Peter's found out that we're going to Castle. He'd been there the year before. He phones Castle and says, why don't you have me along with the two girls? (laughs) What? So Sarah, what Sarah and I did was we, um, I phoned, uh, Russell Minton, who produces the Blu-ray extras, and I said, listen, Russell, it's going to be Peter, Sarah, and I on this road trip. I think you should film it. And he he agreed. So we ended up only doing a two-day road trip 
but they filmed it and we had a ball. It was, we really had a good time and it was funny. It was very funny. It was very, very, very funny. <laughs> we had a lot of laughs. One of the most entertaining things about your seasons uh, on the DVD releases, apart from the shows, of course, was listening to your commentaries. Did you, were you a bit sad oh, once you'd finished all those? You sounded like you had so much fun. Oh, we had a hilarious time. We had such a good time. We would, you know, Peter and I in particular really sparked off each other when we did, a, when, when we did commentaries together because we were very irreverent. Yeah. What's the, what is actually the process of recording a commentary? You're put into a room and they just play the this video with no audio and you just talk over it? Or how do you prepare for that? Um, in the old ones, you used to watch the entire... I'd, you'd do your homework and then you'd come in and... But, you know, it, with this, it's a bit... We tend to watch segments of it, you know, and comment on it. Yeah. But, you know, it's enough to know... You know, you know what's happening. Because you know, usually, you often you know the story. So yeah. You and Peter sparring off each other has been a highlight of conventions and audios and DVDs yeah. for years. <laughs> how, 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 how did that all start? Do you know what? I think the dynamic goes something like this. Peter is the only male with three sisters, right? I am the only female with three brothers and it's like a brother sister thing and i've just always taken the mickey out of, you know and also i get really cranky with him because he's always doing we always having to fit in around peter doing five jobs at once greedy little thing <laughs> so greedy so you know Put it this way, if he just stopped working, three other actors would have a career because he's that busy. Every time you phone him, okay, Pete, how many jobs have you got at the moment? It's hard not to feel the envy. Doctor Who, the fifth Doctor box set, iterations of I. Something's happened on that island. It's an evil place. Bad things happen there. Even the doctor wouldn't bring us to a haunted house. Are those graves? Well, that's disturbing. There's hatred here, Tegan. Anger. It wants us to go. I, I thought I saw someone. In indistinct, moving through the dark. Like a scream without a face. Like insanity walking. It was laughing. I was wrong. I'm not all right. There's something evil here. We can't. Okay. What's going on here, Doctor? It's all well and good being rigid and rational, but you only need to be wrong once and there'll be nothing to help when the ghosts come out to play. I think we walk a demon. Doctor! No! Subscribers get more at bigfinish.com In terms of, um... Matthew Waterhouse, certainly yeah. in terms of the, while, while you were recording with him on the show, I, it felt like it was a story to be that it was a bit tense um, with him on, when you were on the show. And he wrote his, I don't know if you've read, you've read his book, book or not, The Blue Box Boy, um, where he talks about being pretty miserable, more so with Tom <laughs> than with later yeah. people, but just, just in terms of, I think he had these huge dreams, expectations of what would happen when he got on the show and, and none of them were really met. Yeah. Um, I just, in terms of how how was the relationship re-establishing with him when he when he found because it, I mean, it took him years even longer than you to come back to Big Finish and start doing recordings. Oh really? I didn't realise. I thought he'd already done some before I did. No. Oh. No. Oh, I didn't realise that. Um, because he was living in America. Yes. So he. You know, he wasn't really around. Um, I think the thing about him was that Matthew was very young when he did it. And he wasn't, he wasn't a very experienced actor. And 
he didn't kind of speak the same language as the rest of us. So although I wasn't experienced in terms of the camera, I had been working as an actor for some time. So my, you know, I've been doing stage work. I'd only done like a tiny one day part in a Hammer House of Horror. That's all I'd done when I got Doctor Who. Matthew didn't, you know, I think underneath, he's quite a shy man anyway. He's always struck me anyway as being quite shy. So that would be another, uh, you know, element that would make it a little bit trickier for him. Um, and I just, yeah, I think he's, he doesn't, he didn't sort of speak the same language as us, really. It was just kind of, the rest of us were much more experienced in terms of acting and our craft and those kinds of things. Yeah, and I think it looked like you and Peter actually clicked very fast because you've got a very natural relationship with each other on screen. Did you feel yeah, like you and I think Matthew struggled for a role. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mean, I had something very clear, you know, clear line to, to play. I mean, I think Sarah had a harder time than I did because hers wasn't as clear either. And, you know, they overlap because, you know, both she and, Ma and Matthew play scientific teenagers naive. teenagers smart blah 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 you know sarah's character wasn't going to be a through character he decided to, to john decided to include her character because she's so good you know basically i think and because he decided that the, the tardis needed more people in it um and let's be honest, you know, just having two regulars in a series is quite, you know, just the Doctor and a companion, two, two regulars in a series is quite a low number. Even, even for a half hour show, you think of most of the half hour shows that you could name. I mean, half hour dramas are quite rare anyway, but a half hour with only two regulars, that's really unusual. Mm. So, so aside from Big Finish, you don't actually do any more acting? I mean, you're encouraging and still creative. Why, why, did you make, why did you decide to move away from acting? Well, what happened was, in the, when I was, got into my 30s, I was looking at casting, you know, after I left two, I did a series up at Central Television and I did a bit of theatre, but I was looking at casting brief after casting brief and there was nothing I could play you know an actor needs roles that they can play and there was nothing but nothing that I could see that would that I could play so is that when you got involved with women in film and television yeah it was so what, what was the purpose of that organization well a it's still going it's very successful and, and I'd like to think that I laid a good foundation there. And the idea was that men had a network in the business, but women didn't. It was an American model. And the idea was to improve the participation of women in the industry and the roles that women were allowed to play. And when they were originally, when the original board, I'd been involved in starting up another group called Real Women, but then found out that there was a group trying to start a UK branch of women in film and television, which had started in America. And I thought, right, they're doing what I want to do. I'm going to throw in my lot with them. And that's how I came to be their first administrator. But what the point about women, there was, especially in those days, was that they needed a network because there were very few of them in, in powerful positions. And the, the, women who were all involved in the first board, the American model at the time didn't admit actresses. And I argued with the board that, in fact, actresses experienced the sharp edge of discrimination in just the, you know, probably more so than, than most other grades. So we should be admitted 
and indeed they did admit actresses. And now America does as well. You know, the LA chapter does as well. We've been interviewing a few um, different writers for Big Finish because one of the things that Big Finish is working hard to do is improve the situation for female writers, female performers. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And you know, they've been deliberately seeking more female voices and that's been one of the good things to see. Yeah, do, do, yeah. You, do, you, do you feel like things are improving for women now in terms of acting roles, in terms of things being written for them, playing a larger part in their own writings? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm basically optimistic about that. I think that it is getting better in the science fiction world. I see a lot more women at fan conventions. I see a lot more um, women writing for the television and Doctor Who as well. Yeah, I think it's, and, and female directors. You know, were there any female directors of Doctor Who to speak of? When I was doing it, we had we had Mary Ridge and we had Fiona Cumming, the two that I remember. As far as I can tell, it's easier now. So are you happy with how Big Fish are writing Tegan in terms of where the character is? How they've do you feel, do you feel like they're taking her anywhere? Are they, are they giving you more to do? It's very hard to to, to assess because you know. Character is about progression and how, you know, action. So whatever, and, and people change over time. They're, you know, if you don't change over time, then you're doing something wrong. You're not learning life's lessons. But when you are in a series like ours, you're jumping backwards and forwards in time. So what period of progression are you in? So it's quite tricky that. You know, it's not an easy question to answer because, I don't know, the context is, is, is very hard to decide. It isn't always clear what the context is. And you, you have to be, oh, where is she in the story here? Yeah. Um, in terms of her life. I think basically, yes, I am ha fairly happy with how they're, they're writing her. And when I'm not, I say so. That makes a bright view. No, it does actually. It really does surprise me that you'd say anything. Yeah, I know, because I'm so quiet and shy. <laughs> Everybody says that about me. Is it? Is it partly? Um, I mean, I, I my, I have um, a couple of English cousins. And whenever, yeah. I come, whenever I come over to New England, they kind of excuse me to their friends just by saying, "Well, he's Australian." Um, do you ever feel like people just sort of go, "Oh, it's okay, she's Australian"? They certainly do. And it's one of the, you know, people go to me, you haven't lost your Australian accent. And I go, well, the reason why is because now I'm no longer an actress. I don't have to sound English the rest of the time. And the thing about an Australian accent is it allows me to get away with murder. <laughs> so I go, I just say, I'm Australian. What do I know? Yeah. And, um, and I and you know, it'll also with our image is that of cheerfully cheeky. You know, it's got that Australians are thought of as being a bit bit sassy, a bit a, you know, basically quite cheerful, can do people. And that's not a bad stereotype to try to act up to, you know, and <laughs> and, um, and I you know allows me to get away with being a bit cheeky. Which, you know, that may surprise you as well, yeah. Where's home for you now? Where do you feel home is? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't know, both are home. Uh, I must admit, yeah, but, uh, both are home. I do think of Australia as home home. You know how, do you know an English comedian called Mickey Flanagan? Yes. Yeah. And he talks about being out, out. You know, you can go out or you can go out, out, out. out. Well, there's home, home, and there's home. Here is home. Australia is home, home. Have you thought about moving back to Australia? I don't think I could afford to move back to Australia. Bloody hell, it's expensive now. <laughs> Living in Australia would be, you know, for for us from England, it would be incredibly expensive. But the, the truth of the matter is, 
But the bulk of my friends are still here, obviously. Yeah. My family tend to come over reasonably often, like once every couple of years. And I tend to go out there. I mean, I intend to go out once every couple of years. So, provided that I maintain that kind of, um, that ability to travel to Australia on a regular basis. Speaking of your time as an agent, um, mm-hmm. P- Paul McGann, Paul McGann. <laughs> he's been the doctor for the last 25 years. Is it a good thing that uh, he didn't take your advice? What advice? I didn't say did, don't do the job. I said be aware that it will take <laughs> your life. If it, you know, because it's a pilot, so you don't know whether it's going to go ahead. And in fact, it was because science fiction was at that time incredibly expensive to do and needed to meet the same kind of of um, level as, you know, the, the Star Wars and, and what have you had built a certain expectation. So the figures were a bit marginal for the pilot and they didn't go ahead with it. But I had warned him that it would be, uh, would be extraordinary, would change his life. And it did. Certainly did. Yeah. Yeah. And I do see him from time to time at at, um, conventions. Why did you give up being an agent? Was it just... Because at the end of the day, there's nothing you have that's yours. You don't participate in a production. You don't create something that's yours. Even running the charity, you know, I, I, I help create and produce projects. I know, I don't know, I, and, and I just, for that reason, it didn't feel satisfying. I found, I just found it a bit relentless. It didn't allow headspace for anything else. If you were doing it properly, it didn't seem to allow any headspace for anything else. But I love working with the actors, and I love going to, being able to afford to go to the the theatre a lot. That was a joy. But, um, and that was the good things about it. But the bad things were that it was relentless. And also I'm not very ruthless, you know? I mean, I may be, people may think of me as cranky and assertive, blah, 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 but I'm actually not a very ruthless person. And I think you need just a streak of ruthlessness to be a good agent. And that, of course, is their reputation. Now, you said you've got some more filming coming up in December. So does that mean you're... No, not filming. Oh, Um, sorry, audio work coming up in December. Audio. Yeah, big finish. So you're going to turn one of your rooms into a sound studio? Is that the plan? Well, no, we're going to go... We're supposed to be going up to a studio um, in Wadhurst near Tunbridge Wells. Um, So it has... There will be three of us there, Sarah... Matthew and I, but who knows with lockdown? I mean, I've certainly got the equipment here to, you know, record from home. But um, the reason why we're not using my home necessarily is that my internet connection is not at the fastest and it, it does drop out. I mean, I will have several dropouts a day. And that's not uncommon. I mean, I've got a friend in Brighton who complains about the same thing. So Peter won't be there recording at the same time? Is he off filming other things that he's busy? No, he'll be recording from home. Right. As I understand it. If he's off doing something else, he's certainly going to get a complaint from me. But he'll be (laughs) expecting that. What what does a normal studio day look like for cast and crew? Um... Before lockdown, we would go into, we'd go up to Moat Studios, at, which is near um, Portobello, uh, in, in Portobello Road in London, um, off Ladbroke Grove. And you'd roll up at sort of 10 o'clock. Peter would always be just that little bit late, because <laughs> that's Peter? traditional. 
Um, and Toby would have a load of donuts there. So you'd try and resist the donuts for a bit. And then you'd meet you'd meet the new cast, then you'd start recording, and then you'd break at you'd have a morning break of you know ten minutes or so, and then you'd record through to one, then you'd have lunch, and then you'd record through till three-ish, three thirty, and then finish at depend at what time, five, five thirty. Is it ten do you tend to um have a read through then a record or no no you, well you re- rehearse record rehearse record but yes. it's, it's scene by scene you don't read through the whole script and then do it peter peter gets as as you finish recording peter just hurls his the the pages that he's done off he just hurls them in, and his booth always looks like a snowstorm after after about an hour. Do they ever say, hang on, we need page 22 again, and he can't find it? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Correct. That is true. Yeah, that is exactly what happens. Uh, so how, how soon before a recording day do you get scripts? And are usually there for doing a block of... You, you tend, you tend to do weeks. three... Two weeks. Yeah, and, and we do. We do tend to do two or three scripts at once. We sometimes record four a year, sometimes three. Yeah. So, it, it, I mean, it feels like it's, because, because we keep getting it constantly dribbling out all the time, it feels like you're always doing work, but I'm guessing it's only a few days a year then that you're doing. Yeah. How's, how do you spend the rest of your time at the moment? Well, I run the charity. And that's basically full time? That's your big focus? Yeah, basically. Okay. If um, some of our listeners want to donate and support the charity, what, what, what can they do to do that? There's a donate button on our website. And so it all goes through, um, you know, a third party, so, which is secure and all that kind of stuff. And it's called Project Motor House. Yeah. And you'll see loads of the videos about the kinds of things that we do as kids. So. Great. So worth going and having a look at and seeing what, what, what you've been working with. Yeah. Because, I mean, this area is quite a lot of, there's a lot of disadvantaged people in our area. And um, so there's, you know, it's not a rich area at all. It's interesting because in terms of Australia, anyone who lives on the water has money. It's not quite the same. I know. <laughs> the, but England is completely different. It's completely different. We, I mean, it's starting to get better, a little bit better. But what happened in the 70s was that the seaside, the British seaside holiday market just collapsed. People went, why am I going to a British seaside where it might rain, where the landlady will kick me out first thing in the morning, won't allow me back before 5.30 at night. Um, when I can go to, for the, you know, less money, I can go to Spain or Italy. And hot weather. And hot weather. Um, so that's what people did. And what happened was that people who were on benefits, a lot of those seaside boarding houses and stuff started asking, you know, started taking in people who were on benefits because that was the only business they could get. And, um, and so that, that meant that there were high levels of, of poverty in the area. And at the moment, what's happened is that the, the, a lot of the poorer councils in England, or poorer districts are being made poorer because their grant from central government that used to make up the difference is no longer being paid. So it's not good. Is Brexit going to make things worse as well? I think so. I think um, people who describe it as a, as a, a massive act of national self-harm are absolutely right. You can't 
you know. Unless they strike a, an amazing deal, can't see that happening. But who knows? Who knows? I think it's a bad time for, I think it's a bad time for, for, lib, for liberal ideals throughout the world. I mean, I grew up in a world where it was becoming increasingly tolerant, where, where on terms of things like gender and race. And I think a lot of that is being rolled back. That, you know, the European Union, well, it gave, it gave a lot of nations in Europe the longest run of peace they've ever known. I think that's something to value. You don't turn your back on that lightly. And I think, I think people have. Did life get too easy? Well, yeah, and also, I mean, the European Union is not without its flaws, trust me. You know, it's, it's easy to, it's easy to diss, but, you know, people have overlooked the positives. One of the things we do usually ask our guests is in terms of um, if there's anything you've been listening to, reading, watching that you'd like to recommend. Is there anything that has been struck, struck your fancy in the last little while? i tell you what is fantastic. My brother sent me for my birthday, my youngest brother, Ian, sent me Les Norton because I was in Australia when for some of it and I went, I, you know, and I really enjoyed it, but I'd never got to the end of it. So, and I'm rationing myself. So I do a little treat once a week so that I can see it once a week. A bit of Les Norton. A bit of Les Norton, a bit of good. I, I, I just made me hoot with laughter. I thought it was very funny. Yeah, great. Listen, thank you so much for your time, Jan. We really appreciate it. No worries. Six Commonwealth Games open tonight in. Interrupt this broadcast with some breaking news. The city's telephone system has been hit by some kind of electronic attack. The entire network has gone down, causing disruption to many homes and businesses and sparking fears of a terrorist attack. Despite pleas for calm, a number of incidents have already broken out. I know you're a maniac, but do you have to drive like one? Keep it down back there. What's happening? What's this all about? New vandalism could be so painful. I'll, I'll try smashing the windscreen. This is my life. This is what I do. I work and I sleep and that's it. Huh. I thought you'd get You off. thought I'd what? Save the world? Feed all the starving kids in Africa? Be the new James Bond? What? So, that was the famous Tegan Javanka. Yeah. I'm still not sure about this. Stop worrying about it. Now, this doctor, is he going to be a problem? We should have brought a gun or something. Oh, good idea. That way people die. That's not human technology, is it? Not human? Do try and keep up. Are we going up or are we going down? <laughs> We're going right to the top. So, do I get that tip? Yeah. Get out of here. Get out of Brisbane and don't look back. Don't leave me, please! Jesus! And then, the dead will walk. Mad as a box of frogs. Where is it we're going? A bar in 42 Valley, bar 8687. 8687! 8687! Hello, Hello, Doctor. Doctor. The, the gathering, gathering has begun. begun. Freak! <laughs> Let me out! Let me go! Now! That's what terrifies me about him. You have no idea how his mind works. I don't think... I, I don't think anyone really knows who he is. His world, his life, it's not like ours. So as we head into the evening, temperatures are dropping. Hope you all had a great day and are set for the weekend. It starts here, people. It's 6.30 on Friday, September the 22nd, 2006. I'm Rosemary Stark, and here's the Bricklayers with their new single, West... And there you have uh, a trailer for Janet Fielding's first appearance on a Big Finish audio that she spoke about during the interview. That was The Gathering. Can recommend you grab a copy of that from the Big Finish website. Fantastic uh, chat we had there, Philip. Fantastic. 
Thanks for organising that. No, she's a great woman and she's done an awful lot. She's you know, very politically minded. There's a lot of the stuff that we could have talked about in terms of other stuff she's done for women and for the arts. Um, also, just in terms of making sure she's, she's fought pretty hard for the rights of actors in terms of um, their image, making sure people are being paid for the image and things, which we didn't talk about. Um, yeah, it was doing quite full of the audio category. But yes, um, I've had many interesting conversations with her about a whole huge range of topics. Yeah, it's excellent. So we have come to that time once again where we're going to recommend uh, something that we've been listening to that uh, that you might find enjoyable too. That's not necessarily Doctor Who related. I'm gonna I'm gonna recommend two things this time. Uh, first of all, I just want to give a shout out to Cat uh, Armitage, who we spoke to uh, a few weeks back on the podcast about her debut Big Finish audio. She is about to start a podcast called Scaredy Cat, where she she and a friend are going to be reviewing some scary movies. Um, so you can find that on Twitter. Just look for Cat Armitage and there'll be there'll be links to the Scaredy Cat. I think it's Scaredy Cat. She must be the scared one and the other one must be introducing the movies to her. So uh, Scaredy Cat with a K. That's what I recommend for a podcast. And I also recommend... Uh, another podcast called Gallifrey's Most Wanted. They've just done a, a sister podcast on their feed called The Runcible Report, which I really I love that name. It's a cool name for a podcast where they they wax lyrical about certain topics rather than a specific story. And their first episode, they talked about the I Davros box set, which has just been released as a download package. Um, I think it was only previously available on CD, but it's now available as a as a bundle. You can get the whole set uh, on download now. Um, so they they talk about that. Uh, look for the Runcible Report on the Gallifrey's Most Wanted feed. What about you, Philip? Well, I'm going to recommend another podcast, but it's not Doctor Who related. Um, as you mentioned, we're recording this on the first of November, so we're a couple of days away from the presidential American election. So all of you will know who the president is and so we don't know yet. But Ooh. one of the podcasts I've been listening to is called the PEP podcast. Um, it's from, it's connected, was well, not really connected, kind of connected to the Planet America TV show. Um, so Chaz Lizardero and John Barron do a TV show in Australia uh, called Planet America where it's a bunch of Australians they analyse American politics and American history from an Australian point of view and it's quite funny but also quite informative. But there's a podcast connected to that called The Pep Podcast, um, which is Chad Zadero. And it's just, an, he's an Australian comedian uh, which, who's done a lot of other things. Um, but he's talking about American politics. And so it's a fascinating uh, podcast. It goes about an hour or so a week, which just analyzes what's happening in America. But it's pulled away. It's, it's not political. It, well, it's political, but it's not taking a political view. It's just discussing what's happening over there and the possible implications. So I, I try and consider that just, uh, at the moment I've been listening for the last little while, trying to get my head around what's going on and what, what the future might look like. And all of you are listening to this are in the future and you know what's happened. And I'm just waiting with, I don't know, dread or excitement to see what's going to happen next. Um, and glad I'm Australian. <laughs> If it's uh, to do with Chaz Lucidello, I'm sure it would have uh, just a touch of irony in there somewhere as well. Oh, that's for sure. Very there's <laughs> strong moments of sarcasm. And uh, so, yeah, for, for our overseas listeners, there's, there was an Australian program called The Chaser. And there was a bunch of university students, and he was one of them, who used to go and just cause um, really hell havoc. On, <laughs> havoc on a, a different Australian politicians. And even to the point where they actually got themselves arrested at one time. Because when the, um, I forget, I think it was George Bush, the American president was out here, they hired a black car and they dressed themselves up in suits and they made themselves look like security. So they were chugging down Macquarie Street, one of the main streets. <laughs> and um, the, the, security I remember forces that. Let, the security forces let them in. And so they, they, you know, they were expected to be turned around at the gate because you know, the, the, the president's always security. But they actually were allowed in. And then here, and in, the, in the limo was someone dressed up as... Um, yeah, you know, this Arab terrorist, and suddenly they had this major panic attack. That what, what are we doing? Because we're now coming up to the president, and we've been allowed into the secure zone. And they had this 
big panic and they all got themselves arrested <laughs> for that. Um, and yeah, they've done similar things too. So, you know, the bane of many politicians' life, but now they're all embarking on different areas. As I said, Chaz is doing American politics. Another one of them is involved in looking after the environment um, as they age and mature. One of them was a real diehard Doctor Who fan. It was Andrew... Andrew? I can't remember his... Hanson. Andrew Hanson. And he's yeah, still, yeah. Um, he, he attends Doctor Who conventions whenever we have them. So, um, yeah, he's, he's, he's a huge Doctor Who fan. And, uh, yeah, we'll Let's get him on. Let's get him on and talk about Big Finish. Okay. I'm sure he'd do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Philip. Thanks for that recommendation. And don't forget, listeners, we have got lots and lots of good things in store for you coming up uh, on the sirens of audio so uh, make sure you subscribe like drop some feedback send us a nice email at sirens of audio at gmail.com follow us on twitter at audio sirens uh, check out our web page and our reviews page on sirens of audio.com let us know what you think if you want to write a review for a big finish audio that you've heard send it in we might even put it up on the website why not we do that philip we will indeed very good so until you hear from us again listen to lots of lovely audio because audio drama rocks, rocks. rocks.